Well, a very good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're doing well, keeping yourself safe and sound. Welcome to week two of semester two for CIN 535. So very quickly, I'll just go and share my screen so that you're able to view the Moodle page. Okay, so here we are. I hope you are all able to see the model page for CN 535. Uh, we went through most of the basic things that you should know on the model shell last week. Now, just for a week two, some of the common things that I would you I would like you to be aware of. Your class timetable still remains the same. There were a few clashes here and there, uh, and I had some working students requesting me if I could change the timetable. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, go well with the others in terms that if I try to resolve the clash on one end, so students on the other side, they would have another clash. And to actually cater for all the working students, we have the recording. So week one, the recording, both the recordings are there for the lecture and the lab class. And the same thing will follow for week two. Moreover, those of you who have just joined in today, do notice that underneath the timetable, you have the Zoom link. And in your announcement section, you will generally have all the things that you need to do for that particular week. For instance, let's have a look at our announcement for week two. So for week two, you are supposed to attend the Zoom-based lecture class, which you are doing at the moment, okay? And then, you have a lecture-based quiz straight after. Once you have, uh, once we have discussed the lecture notes, you can always go and attempt your lecture quiz. Notice that the lecture quiz uh, due date is on thirty-first of October. You can take time all all the way to thirty-first of October. But I'm guessing while things are still fresh in your mind, please do go and attempt them, and do not take everything uh, till the last moment. Moreover, in tomorrow morning's class from 9 to 11 a.m., we'll have our lab class. Last week, we did cover a few basic aspects of the lab class and we'll continue from where we had left off last week. So for week two, you have your lecture notes, you have your week two lecture-based quiz, quiz rather, and your lab files will be coming in tomorrow. Uh, most likely tomorrow morning, before we actually go around attempting it, your lab files will be there. And there are some supplementary materials that you can view it in your own time. Now, without any further ado, we'll go and hop into our lecture notes. So just before we do that, do we have any questions or any queries from anyone, from those participants who have joined us over Zoom? Do you have any questions or queries? If you do have, uh, please do feel free to unmute and speak, and we'll try to resolve issues here in the class. Uh, hello, sir. Yes, I do have a question. Yes, Uh For our labs, do we need any specific softwares? Uh, uh, I'm not sure on this. Okay, generally for CN 535, the specific software that we generally use is Adobe Master Collection. Okay. But due to uh, online mode constraints, we are not using that software anymore. So instead of using Adobe Photoshop, we're using a website called photop.com, photopea.com. So if you refer to your to our lab recording, which is under week one section of the Moodle show, okay. it, you'll be able to view it, photopea.com. And for even if you join us tomorrow morning, you should be able to uh, continue from where we left off. Just to advise, Ashnil, I think you you weren't there in last week's class, right? Yes, yes, I just started today. Okay. This so is my first you, class, yeah. This is your first class. So what you can do is just probably by tonight, just have uh -huh. a good look at the lab recording because uh, tomorrow when we actually start off with the lab, we'll continue from where we had left off last week. Okay, sure. So you'll have a good feel of what we'll be doing in the class. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for your question. Anyone else has any questions, any queries before we start discussing our lecture notes?
No questions, no queries. If not, let us begin. Okay. So I'll uh, quickly open up the lecture notes. I hope you are able to see the lecture notes on your screens at the moment. So in this week, uh, in this week's lecture, we'll be looking at text. This is pretty simple. Uh, I think all of you know what texts are. And if I would just call out saying the word text, you should, and you will be able to picture, okay, you may be thinking probably words, you may be thinking probably, okay, something on Microsoft Word, and you are right in that, okay? So text may be something like that, but what we'll be looking at here is why text is important in multimedia projects. So overview, the objectives of, uh, the objectives of this particular lecture slide is, we want to figure out what is the importance of text in a multimedia presentation. We also want to understand the different types of fonts and typefaces. Moreover, we'll be looking at some text elements in a multimedia presentation. We'll look at the relationship between computers and text. We'll look at some font editing and design tools. And also, we finally will be looking at the connection between multimedia and hypertext. Now, the second last point, font editing and design tools. Last week, we were using a uh, authoring software, uh, photop.com, that's like a direct replica of Adobe Photoshop. So that can also be counted in as a font editing and a design tool. Importance of text in a multimedia presentation. Now, just in case, while we are discussing, if you have any questions or any queries, feel free to unmute and ask. I am most happy to accommodate questions while we are discussing things. Importance of text in a multimedia presentation. Words and symbols in any form, spoken or written, are the most common means of communication. Text is a vital element of multimedia menus, navigation systems, and content. Now, Text, in terms of multimedia presentations, they are used specifically or nonetheless for these particular purposes, for menus, for navigation systems, and the most important one is for content. Now, we must know that every single word may be cloaked in many meanings. That means, what it simply means is the words that we have, they may have a lot of meanings. Probably one word may have or can refer to two or three different types of meanings. So when you're working with text, multimedia designers need to aim for accuracy and conciseness. When we talk about conciseness, we're talking about being precise, be, being clear. Words and symbols are common forms of communication, either in terms of spoken or written. Just because of this reason, text and symbols form a very vital element in multimedia projects. So text and symbols, they come together and they form very vital elements in multimedia projects. The power of meaning, multimedia developers must use words carefully and accurately. Just mentioned previously, why carefully and accurately? Because what may happen is some words may mean differently either in different languages, and when you are using words, you are ensuring that you're hitting the hammer on the head of the nail. It's like you're not trying to beat around the bush, but you're trying to be very clear. So as mentioned earlier, okay, text needs to be very concise and they need to be very, very accurate. Factors affecting legibility of text. When you, when you talk about the word legibility, that means uh, we are basically dealing with readability, how easy it is to read, the clarity, the clear, the cleanness of something, and basically the quality of being clear enough to read. That's legibility. So if I would have a look at a text or a sentence, if I'm not able to read it properly, so I would say, okay, the legibility is very poor. But if I'm able to read it clearly, so I'm saying, all right, it is legible, I can read it. So there are four factors. We have size. Now size generally refers to the size of the text. We have background and foreground colors. So when we talk about background and foreground colors, we are talking about 
the color of the text that it is written in, when we say written in, that's covering for foreground and written on, that's a background. So let's say you have a text which is black in color. So that text has a foreground of black and it's, let's say it's formatted or highlighted into yellow. So you would say the background color is yellow. So the color of the text that it is written in and written on. Style, the third legibility factor that you have over there is the style is generally, it covers up two things, typeface and font. Now, just in the next few slides, we'll get to know what typeface is and what font is. And finally, leading. Leading generally refers to the amount of added space between the lines. So the Let's, for example, we have a line space of 1 or 1.15 or 1.5 or 2. Now that, in terms of legibility, it is called leading, the space that you have in between lines. Understanding fonts and typefaces. A typeface is a family of graphic characters, often with many type sizes and styles. A font is a collection of characters of a single size and style belonging to a particular typeface family. So you have a typeface. Typeface is like a family of graphical characters. And with font is just like you have a collection of characters of a single size, of a single style for a particular typeface. So you have typeface, typeface has many types of fonts. Now, let me give an example. An example of typeface is Helvetica. Now we have that in Microsoft Word. Okay, Helvetica is a typeface. Times, not Times New Roman, but just Times. Times is also a typeface. Korea is also a example of typeface. Now with font, okay, so we have, let's say typeface times, so the font or one of the fonts of typeface times is Times New Roman. One of the uh, fonts for the typeface Helvetica is Calibri. Are you familiar with Calibri, Times New Roman? Okay. And the, uh, let's say we have Korea. That's a typeface. And the font may be Arial. So that is the difference between typeface and font. Remember, typeface is a family of graphical characters. Font is basically a type of typeface. Understanding fonts and typefaces continued. The study of fonts and typefaces includes the following. You have font styles font styles, the different types of fonts, for example, Times New Roman, Arial, Calibri, what else do you have? Monotype Cursiva, and so forth. All the different types of fonts that you generally choose in Microsoft Word, for instance, those are font styles. Now, font sizes, the size of the fonts, five pixels, 10 pixels, 70 pixels, so forth. Now, cases. Cases generally refers to uppercase, lowercase, you have capitalized word case, you have sentence case. I think you're familiar with uh, uppercase and lowercase. Uppercase is basically in capital letters and lowercase is generally in smaller letters. Now, with capitalized letter, it is whereby all the letters would be, all the uh, first letters of the word would be capitalized. And sentence case would be how you go around writing a normal sentence. So the first character in the first word of a sentence is going to be capitalized. The others are going to be all lowercase until you have a full stop. So those are cases. And then we have serif versus sense serif. Now, serif is basically a French word for the word decoration and sans serif that means none sans means none serif is decoration let me repeat that sans serif 
and serif, these are French words. So the word, so, so, so the meaning of the word serif means decoration. Sans serif means no decoration or none decoration. So let's have a look at sans serif in, in the later slides. Uh, we're still on understanding uh, fonts and typefaces. So the font styles that we generally have include boldface. Now boldface is same as saying something is bold. Okay, you have italic. I think you all know bold italic underline. Now what is outlining? Outline. I don't know if you remember this or not. Few years back in Microsoft Word, I think it's still there. You had something called as word art. So if you want to have a fancy uh, type of text or fancy way of placing your text with all the fancy colors, then you'll have those word art feature. So when you click on the word art feature, you'll see some texts that have a color of, let's say yellow. And on the border of those texts, the color would be black. So those are examples of outlining. Yellow is the color of the texts. And then that, for example, the letter A, the outer layer, have a look at this. This section, the outer layer would be in color black. So that is called as outlining. Now, if we combine all these font face, italics, underline, outlining, they form something called as a formatting feature. Now, if you have done CN501, in CN501, you should learn that they are formatting features, okay? So these formatting feature, they generally go around formatting texts. In, in, in the terms of CN501, Microsoft Word formatting features are used to format your documents. Here, you're formatting text to be used in multimedia projects. Now, since uh, serif versus sans serif. A serif is the little decoration at the end of the letter stroke. So if you want to know what the decoration looks like, this is a serif based character. Serif fonts are used for body text. That's simple, okay, it's used for body text. Sans serif fonts do not have a serif, a little decoration. Serif means decoration. So sans serif do not have that. At the end of the letter stroke, these fonts are used for headlines and bold statements. So to summarize that, the typefaces are of two types. One is serif and the other one is sans serif. The word serif basically indicates that there is little decoration at the end of the letter stroke and these type of texts are generally used for body text. Sans serif on the other side is the text that has no decoration. And these are generally used for headings and titles. And like mentioned earlier on, uh, earlier on, sans is a French word or even serif is also a French word. And the word sans means none or without, okay? so. Serif, decoration, sans serif, without decoration. I think that's easier to recall. Any questions so far? Now, you don't have uh, final assessments, uh, sorry, final exams in CN 535, it's 100% course of it. So where are these going to be tested in your quiz? Another place these things may be tested is in your mid-semester exams, okay? So, so far, going back from the very beginning, I would like you to know, okay, the importance of using text. Okay, do put a note somewhere, the importance of using text. Also, you should know what are some factors that affect the legibility of text. When you are looking at the word legibility, it means readability or clarity. You should know the difference between typefaces and font, and you should be able to give some examples. Okay, the simple one, okay, I think all of you are familiar with Times New Roman. So the typeface is Times, font type is Times New Roman. And 
do take note of this. You should know the difference between serif and sans serif. All right, using text elements in a multimedia presentation. So text elements are used Text elements used in multimedia are, so this is how text elements are used. They use for menus for navigation. They use in terms of interactive buttons. They use in terms of fields for reading. And they use in terms of HTML documents. And they use in terms for symbols and icons. Now the brief description of these I'll be giving in the next uh, next few set of slides because we have different subtopics for each of them. Now using text elements in multimedia presentation continued. So when you're choosing text, you need to ensure that you consider the legibility and the readability. That means it should be able, it should be clear, and you should be able to read them properly. Also, avoid too many typefaces. Why avoid too many typefaces? If you are using a lot of different types of typefaces or different types of fonts, now what is happening is that it becomes overly decorated. So it may end up looking either ugly, it may end up looking a work of a amateur designer and you do not want your presentation to look something as such. And use the final thing over there is use color purposefully. That means use the color which seems natural. Use the color whereby it looks good on the text. And also make wise use of colors and color combinations. Now, sometimes you think that a com color combination would work well. For example, combining yellow with green. Okay. Or you think, okay, instead of making the cloud blue or white, I will put it to some other color. It might look good. Now, if you're thinking along those lines, it's okay to think that, but do try it out. Try out some trial and error and see if it looks well for that particular combination. If it does, thumbs up. If it doesn't, go back and change it to something else. And if you notice the text that you're seeing on uh, the presented slide, it says, we have your kitten. Now, this is, now, if you look at those texts, would you call it as Either it's legible or it's not legible. Well, it is legible, but it looks ugly, right? It doesn't look right. It looks like you have to put in a lot of effort to read it. Now, imagine you have a billboard which acts some, something like this. I would say it would be a disaster. It's just waste of money because people will not be able to read it properly. Okay, using text elements in a multimedia presentation continued, choosing text fonts. So when you are choosing text fonts, you need to ensure one, use anti-alias texts. Now, what are anti-alias texts? Now, anti-alias are the smooth lines with the less of distortions in a text. When we say distortions, now sometimes you have those font styles which are way too curly and which are way too difficult to sometimes read. Sometimes you are able to read it, but you feel others may not actually understand it. Now you must have gone through some of those text uh, font styles in Microsoft Word when you try different types of fonts and some are just too aliased. That means they are too uh, distorted to actually read. So we're trying to avoid all those kind of text. So that's why we're saying use anti-alias text. Remember your multimedia presentation, especially for web elements, you're targeting not thousands, but you're targeting millions of people at once. So you need to ensure that you are using your fonts correctly. And use drop caps and initial caps for accent. Okay. Uh, when we say accent, drop caps, and initial caps, what it simply means here is now if you are using uh, text for different languages, now you need to ensure that you're using it properly. Now, sometimes there are some languages and texts which require you to place capitalized letters in the middle of a word because that's how it, uh, they are. For example, have you had a look at the word PhD? It's capital P, small h, and then capital D. Now, you need to ensure you're using it properly. So that's what it is. That's what it means over there. 
Now minimize center text. Try to have it as justified as possible. Okay. Use a white space. If you have a multimedia presentation and it has a lot of white space, avoid it. Avoid putting a lot of white, uh, white spaces because you're just wasting the space. Why not have your multimedia in smaller size and instead of having a large, big, silent, small text in the middle, make appropriate use of the white space. And finally, use animated text to grab attention. Now, animated text, the word animated means something that does not stay still, that's animated. So if you're using animated text, that means your text is moving around on the screen or either your text is blinking or either your text has some sort of color changing element. If you're using that, that's good, but try to use it to the best of the abilities and also ensure it looks presentable and readable. Symbols and icons. Okay, symbols are concentrated text in the form of a stand on graph, uh, graphic construct. So when you're looking at symbols, okay, basically these are images or combination of images and text. Now, generally in these terms, we are, since we are referring to text elements, so generally we are looking at symbols and icons with the combination of text. Now, each and every symbol, they are supposed to convey meaningful messages. When I say convey, the word convey means to give out or to pass out, okay? So each and every symbol and icons are supposed to mean something and meaningful message. For example, if you see a trash can symbol in a Windows-based computer, so what does that indicate? Recycle bin or you're trying to dispose something. Also in, let's say Microsoft uh, on Windows based computer, you see a hourglass symbol. So what does that indicate? That tells you to wait while something is being processed. Okay, now first one here, it says stop, that means you're supposed to stop. The second one means something like a pedestrian crossing. Okay, third one, something like a restaurant kind of symbol. And now where would you see this? You'll generally see the symbol on Google map. Okay, whereby uh, they try to feed in some restaurant locations. So you will see that. And the last one, no smoking. See, even you will notice that second, third, and the fourth symbol, they do not have any text used in them. But they all mean something. And how do we know it? Because it's throwing out, it's picking out, and also it's so familiar. It's be and it's become so common. So people just know it by looking at it. Now, this is what some of you may be using a lot. Okay, you have symbols and icons. Now, symbols used to convey human emotions are called emoticons. Emoticons, you must be using it in your social media apps, for example, Viber, or you're using it in a messenger, okay? So emoticons, now the name has changed from emoticons since people found the name very odd, emoticons. They've changed it to emojis, okay? So emoji or emoticons is a combination of images with icons, okay? Now, a few years back, about five years back from now, these options whereby at the moment, if you're using, let's say, Viber, and then you have a um, icon, just like a smiley face icon, click on it, it gives you a set of options of which of the emojis to select. Now, previously we didn't have that. So what we were supposed to do is we had to remember the symbol codes. So these are the symbol codes. So a smiley face would be something like this. Okay, so a smiley face or wink would be the second option here. Okay, uh, I think uh, this one, yeah, this, uh, the colon with B, would give you a heart emoji, something like that, okay? And if you would try using some of these, they still work in Viber or Messenger. Now, remember, I mentioned that we will be going over these here. Uh, so these are the text elements used in multimedia and the purposes. So we'll go and have a look at that. Also, please do note of emoticons and emojis and what are they? So 
this is what it is. Uh, this is where texts are used for generally. Texts are generally used for menus in navigation. Now, navigation, that means, or what the word navigation means is the ease of you to jump from one location to the other. And navigation generally provides you with the means, okay? A user navigates through content using a menu. A simple menu consists of a text list of topics. Now, multimedia projects generally consist of a body of information, content, okay? So you have a lot of content. Now to go through those contents, a navigation menu is generally required. And the simple way of using a navigation menu is this, a text list of topics. So you have a list of topics and when you click on it, it takes you somewhere, okay? So that's menus for navigation. And then you have interactive buttons. The word interactive means it allows you to interact it allows you to play around with it, okay? So interactive button, a button, it uh, is a clickable object that executes a command when activated. When we say executes a command, it's just like there's a set of codes behind the button. So the button is supposed to, let's say, multiply something. So when you click on the multiply button, so it multiplies values. Now, how, it, how does it do it? It's not that you create a button and put an X on it, it starts multiplying in its own. No, it does not. There's a set of program, uh, there's a set of programming code behind that button, or probably a script behind that button. So that button becomes active only if that code is working well. Second point: users can create their own buttons from bitmaps and graphics. This is mostly applicable for web projects. So if you want to create a button, you can have a image, you can have a text, and that can be converted into a graphic. The design and the labeling of buttons should be treated as an industrial art project. Why? Why industrial art project? When you talk about industrial art project, you're talking about standards. So when you are designing your buttons and labels for a website, for instance, you need to ensure that they are following certain standards. Now, let's go and summarize the entire thing here for interactive buttons. Buttons are made of objects and text. These buttons make things happen when pressed. A simple text and graphic can also be used as a button on web projects. Fields for reading. Reading a hard copy is easier and faster than reading from a computer screen. And I'm sure most of us will agree. Unless you're too used to, unless you started reading from a computer screen and then moved over to a hard copy, that's a different case. But I'm guessing most of us, because we have gone through the high school system, we have gone through the primary school system, and we have read things through hard copy. Unless you went to a primary school or high school where you were actually doing things from a tablet, please do let me know where is this high school in Fiji. And then I also would send some people over there to study as well. But I'm very much sure it wasn't the case. So we all started reading from hard copy. A document can be printed in one of two orientations. You have portrait or landscape. Now portrait is up to down and landscape is left to right, okay? So, uh, so what fields for reading generally indicates is providing a section for readers to actually print out hard copies for reading. Now, this is not me saying, but experiments have shown over time that reading on screens tend to be challenging compared to reading on a hard copy. So just to cater for that, when you're creating multimedia projects and using text, you need to provide avenues whereby readers are actually able to print things. HTML documents, uh, the abbreviation, HTML stands for hypertext markup language. HTML documents are marked using tags. Now, later onwards, I think somewhere from week eight onwards, after you come from your break, you will be working on HTML and CSS as well. So I'll, I will be guiding you through how to create basic websites, it's just a very basic unit, CN535, but I'll do guide you to a phase where you can even create websites. Uh, as per the current standard, okay? So HTML documents, 
Okay, so this is a standard document format for displaying text pages. Sorry, pardon me. This is a standard document format for displaying text on web pages. So if you're viewing a particular website, a website is generally formed from many individual web pages. So in order for you to create a single web page, you need to learn certain web programming languages. And the very basic that you basic one that you need to learn is HTML. So generally, HTML is a markup language because it uses marked tags to go around creating those web pages. Now, HTML documents, when you're creating it, a developer can specify the different type different types of type pages. The size of the type uh, typeface or font, the color, and many other text properties. So that's why text elements are important on web pages. And you will you will also agree to this: is what is a website without a uh, without set of text? You'll hardly see a website without text. If you if your website is even about all images, you will still need to see some text and the effective use of text. So another way, another place where text is used is in HTML documents. And we have some commonly used tags. You have B tag for bold, and then you have OL for ordered listing. You have IMG for inserting in images. Okay, so you'll learn more about them come week eight onwards. So from week eight, Week 9, week 10, 11, 12, and 13, we will be going over uh, developing websites. Hypermed uh, multimedia and hypertext. So what all things are inclusive here? In terms of multimedia and hypertext, you have multimedia itself. You have hypertext systems. You have uh, using hypertext systems, you have search for words, you have hypermedia structures and hypertext tools. If these sound too confusing to you, don't worry, you will learn them in the next few slides. So the first one is multimedia. Just like we had discussed last week, multimedia is defined as the combination of text, graphics and audio elements into a single presentation. So what you're doing is you're combining text, graphics, and audio into a single presentation or single file. When the user assumes control over the presentation, it is called an interactive multimedia. So once again, interactive multimedia is when the user has control over the elements in a presentation. Now, interactive multimedia becomes hypermedia when a structure of linked elements is provided for the user for navigation and interaction. So remember, interaction is generally when the user has control over the multimedia. And when you have a interactive multimedia, which is structured in links of elements or in linked elements, that becomes a hypermedia. Now, what does it actually mean? And where is it applied? You have interactive multimedia, for example, you are viewing a website, you click on the home button, it allows you to go into the home page. So that's an example of interactive multimedia. Now, when you have a structure of links on a website, sometimes you may have home, about us, contact us, product services. Now, all five of those, when you combine them, they form something called as a hypermedia. So that's a, that's a very uh, proper example of interactive multimedia and hypermedia. Hypertext systems. Hypertext is defined as organized cross-linking of words, images, and other web elements. A system in which words are keyed or indexed to other words is referred to as a hypertext system. A hypertext system enables the user to navigate through text in a non-linear way. In simple terms, when you talk about hypertext systems, you're talking about navigations. Now you're not talking about navigations, but you're talking about hypermedia over here. Why hypermedia? It's structured. Hypertext generally is structured. And let's, uh, let's say, for example, if you're viewing or if you're looking at hypertext systems for websites, so you have three types of hypertext systems. 
For example, you have a hepatic system whereby it allows you to jump from your current website to another website. If you're using, let's say, FNE website, from here, if you click some, click on one of those buttons or one of those commands, you jump into, let's say, use piece website. Okay, that's one. Second one is you are jumping within the website. For example, if you are on FNU's homepage and when you click on students or you could click on Moodle, it takes you to the Moodle page, but you are still within FNU's website. And the last one is the last type of web-based hypertext system is you are jumping from one location to another within that particular web page. For example, you are right on top of FNU's homepage, you click on a particular element, you're on the same page, but you are going down into another uh, element within that web page. So that's the third option. Let me repeat that in websites. Now this is very important because we will be covering this up later on as well. So in websites, there are three types of hypertext systems. One, you jump from one web page to another. Two, you jump from one web page to another website. And the next one is you're jumping from one location to another within the particular web page. So three of them. Hypermedia structures. So in hypermedia structure, generally it consists of four elements. So you have links, you have nodes, you have anchors, and you have navigating hypermedia structures. So the first part of hypermedia structure that we'll be looking at is links. I think most of you must be familiar with links. If you're doing IT, or RS or CS and you do not know what links are, then that might be a problem, okay? But you should know generally, or even if you don't know, we're still learning. It's good to learn, okay? So links are generally connections between conceptual elements. Links are the navigation parts and menus. Now, this seems rather very difficult to understand. So let me put it out in a simple way. When you talk about links, these are connections between elements. For example, remember homepage example. So when you click on homepage, when you click on home, you go on the homepage. When you click on products, you go on the products page. So that is an example of a link. It makes connections between elements. Now, another way in which you can use links or another definition of links is it navigates through elements. That means there are connections and it allows you to navigate through elements within a particular multimedia presentation. Now, a website is one of the famous types of uh, multimedia presentations. So that's why I am using a lot of website examples at the moment. So let me repeat that links, their connection between elements and it navigates between elements. The next part of hypermedia structure is nodes. Nodes are accessible topics documents, messages, and content elements. Nodes and links form the backbone of a knowledge access systems. When you talk about nodes, you're talking about a single concept or idea. Now that concept or idea, it can be in the form of text, it can be in the, top, in the form of graphic, it can be in the form of animation, audios, videos, images, or even programs. So node, is basically a single concept of idea in the hypermedia structure. That means you have a structured hyperlink. Within that, you have a single concept or idea. Now, a very good example, example of nodes is as such. Uh, let's say you have a website. In the website, you have home, about us, contact us, products, services. So when you click or, or when you take your cursor on the products link, it gives you a set of menus. So products, for example, shoes, clothes, uh, men's uh, item, women's items, and so forth. So those options, shoes, clothes, men's, and women's items, those are examples of nodes, single concepts or ideas. Next up is Anchor. Now, Anchor is also uh, a 
part of hypermedia. Uh, anchor is defined as the reference from one document to another document, image, sound, or file on the web. The source node linked to the anchor is referred to as a link anchor. The destination node linked to the anchor is referred to as a link end. Okay, let me simplify this. When you talk about anchors, basically this is a reference from one element to another. Now this element can be in terms of one uh, element within a web page. It can be a web page of its own, or it can be a website. So it can be any of those elements. So anchors basically are reference from one element to another. And there are two types of anchors. So the first one is the source and the other one is the destination. Source, for instance, is this. When you click on something, which is a link, for example, let's say there's a link, when you click on that link, so that is the source anchor. And then the link lends you into another page or into another section of a page. So that is your destination anchor. Let me repeat that. Let's say you have, uh, let me repeat that in terms of an example. You have created a website of your own. In your website, you have said uh, to stay tuned, refer to my Facebook page. So your Facebook page is linked to your uh, actual Facebook page. Okay. So the words Facebook page is linked to your Facebook page. Now, if somebody clicks on that link, so that's an example of source anchor. And when you land up onto your Facebook profile, so that's your destination anchor. I hope this is simple and clear to understand. Navigating hypermedia structures. The simplest way to navigate hypermedia structures is via buttons. Location markers must be provided to make navigation user friendly. Okay. When you talk about hypermedia, it needs to be user friendly. One. Moreover, it is the best and the simple way, the best and the simple way to have uh, a user-friendly navigation is the use of buttons. Now, generally, when you look at your website with home, about us, contact us, product services, now they act as buttons. Now, you also have navigation maps on websites. What are navigation maps? Some websites, they have something called as a site map. So when you click on that particular page sitemap, it shows you the entire structure of the website. So when you click on that structure, now within the structure, let's say there are four layers. So within the four layers, the first one shows, okay, home, and then you have products, you have services. So what kind of products and services do you have? So when you click on other, other of those buttons, it takes you to the destination page, okay, or the destination anchor. Now that combination of sitemaps, generally gives you a very good example of navigating hypermedia structures. Now, hypertext systems are useful. So this is these are some of the places where hypertext systems are used in or used for. They're used for electronic publishing and reference works. They're used in technical docu documentations. Okay, they're used in educational courseware, interactive kiosks, and electronic catalogs. Now let's look at the first example, electronic publishing. When you talk about electronic publishing, it's just an example of having an ebook. So when you have an ebook, you'll notice that sometimes on the right hand side, sorry, on the left hand side of your screen, you'll have a set of subtopics. And when you click on the topic, it takes you directly to that particular page. So that's an example of hypertext systems used in electronic publishing. Second one, technical documents. Uh, for example, you have manuals, you have menus, menus for using a particular system, manual for using something. Now they have a set of links right on the very first page, even the table of content. So when you click on the topic in the table of content, it takes you to that specific page. So that's an example of a technical document. You have educational courseware. Moodle is the best example. Educational courseware. So when you are Moodle, okay, you click on different uh, elements or different links, it takes you to that specific page. So that's hypertext system. You have interactive kiosks. Now, interactive kiosks, I'm not so sure whether we have this here in Fiji. I'm just trying to recall where it is or if we have it somewhere. 
account necessarily oh we have an airport store we have kiosks interactive kiosks in airports so generally when you're trying to let's say go abroad and you're trying to pull out your ticket and your seat number you can use interactive kiosk at the airport another good example is not rather kiosk but atm machines can also be something similar to interactive kiosks and then you have electronic catalogs uh where i have i see an electronic catalog frauds and tapus and jacks they release the electronic catalogs so uh you're able to view it okay if you click on one end of the page it flips so those are examples of electronic catalogs and these are some of the many places where hypertext systems are used so summary this is one of the most important elements in multimedia why because they bring out the message or another uh, other reasons why text is used in terms of symbols and icons and the main reason is they are used for navigation purposes the standard document format used for web pages is called html yes hyper, hypertext markup language basically is the only language that allows you to read web pages dynamic html uses cascading style sheets when you talk about the html you are talking about combining combining css by the way css cascading style sheets these this is a programming language, a web programming language that allows you to add styling to your HTML. And what it does, it gives you greater control over the design. Multimedia is a combination of text, graphics, and audio elements into a single presentation. A hypertext system enables the user to navigate through text in a non-linear way. And finally, right at the very end of the lecture slide, just like you had it uh, in last week's slide, you have I test myself questions. Now, this is where I'll let you give it a go. Okay, see if you're able to find the answers. If you aren't, then you can communicate with the friends, you can communicate with me, and then I can actually let you know what the, ask, what the answers could be for those questions. And that finishes our slides. Any questions, any queries, anyone? Any questions, any queries? Are you facing any problems? Okay, first of all, any questions about the lecture slides? Something was difficult to understand. You can feel free to speak. No, all good. Okay. Now, I think about 10 more minutes of your time before we can call up the class. Now, in this five to 10 minutes, what I want you to do is let's have a consultation in terms of I'll give opportunity to each and every one of you to speak. And you tell me the difficulties you are facing in CRM 535 at the moment in terms of you're finding it difficult to use Moodle, you have internet connection difficulties, time management, and so forth. Now, why am I asking these things? So that I can improve on, okay? At the moment, I'm not getting much feedback. Generally, when I'm in the class, and when I see the uh, students, or generally when I would look at them, I get some sort of feedback. Okay, they're understanding things, they're not understanding things. Over here, I'm not able to see you. I'm not able to hear from you unless and until you speak. So throw me some feedbacks and where possible, I'll try my best to improve on those things. And yeah, so that our delivery is going to be better. So what I'll do is I'll go right from the top. So we'll take turns to speak and see if you have some suggestions or if we have some problems. If you do, we'll go and try to resolve it. So some of you just went offline straight away. So Krishna, we'll get to hear from you. So no difficulties. I all can good. understand. Okay. All, yes, good from your, all good from your end so far? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ashnil, you joined us today. Uh, still, if you are facing any difficulties now or probably in future, you're most welcome to let us know.
Abhishek, what about you? Abhishek, any? Yeah, only the left one. Only the left portion, you're finding it difficult at the moment? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this this pretty normal Abhishek at the moment because we have just uh, had one class. So probably after one or two classes, you'll get well versed with it. That's just quite normal with uh, Photoshop. The, the first few classes, students are generally, students generally find things, uh, find things difficult, but after a few classes, you should catch up well. So okay. it's not really a problem there. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, below, what about you? So all good. All good. Okay, thank you. Yes, Zal, sir. Zal, how are you doing? All good, sir. All good. Okay, thank you. Nishika? All good, sir. Okay, all good. Okay, that's fine then. Seema? All good, sir. All right. And Neil, uh, thank you, okay, for your feedback. So, so far, I think we're doing well. So just in case in future, if you are facing difficulties, please feel free to let me know, either through the use of emails, or you can send me Moodle messages, just in case if you're not comfortable in speaking out. And we also have the consultation class. So consultation class generally is on Fridays, okay? So we'll have it right at the very end. So they'll be able to cover up our labs. Or what we can also do is with our lecture class, just like today, whereby we went around finishing things quite early than expected. This is the time you can all speak your concerns and we'll try to come to a solution. All right. So, so, so far, everything is going well. I've seen most of you attempting your lecture base quiz. There are few of you have not attempted yet. Please do make an effort to go and attempt your week one lecture base quiz. Also, go around attempting your week two lecture based quiz while things are still fresh in your mind. Now, your lecture based quiz is only based on your lectures and on that specific lecture only. So this is week two lecture quiz, so it will be only based on lecture two and not on lecture one. So, there you go. So, that's like about 10 marks. So, if you're doing well, so you get 10 marks and few percentages, of course, uh, percentage and few percentages towards your coursework. All right then, any further questions or queries? No, if no further questions and queries, so we'll bring our class to end, okay? Do feel free to go over the supplementary materials and in tomorrow's lab class, we will continue from where we had left off. I think we were designing a banner. So we'll continue from there. All right. So then take care, stay safe, everyone. See you all in tomorrow's class. Thank you. Thank you, sir.